As we all know, Sega faced one of the greatest hurdles in its history with trying to turn around the fortunes of its ailing Saturn brand. 1995 had not been kind to Sega in Western territories, and the PlayStation established a foothold it would not easily yield. With 1996 going very much the same way, big changes hit that summer with the resignation of Tom Kalinske. Then chairman of Sega, Iseo Okawa, set out to approach the US and European markets with a vastly different and aggressive strategy. Sega approached the head of working designs, Victor Ireland, with the challenge of a lifetime. Take charge of Sega of America and stop the bleeding of the current Saturn business model. Ireland accepted and immediately went to work. He recognized the complete failure of the previous leadership to localize and release the system's best games from Japan. He commissioned multiple teams within Sega to translate and publish numerous projects, and built a number of relationships to make sure Saturn received ports of some of the industry's top-selling third-party games. Among those was Capcom's Resident Evil 2. Wanting the later-released Saturn game to be special, Capcom decided to use the 4MB RAM expansion cart to minimize load times and increase texture quality. Sega also sent numerous software engineers to aid in the project, many of whom worked on titles like Virtua Fighter 2 and Decathlete. The game was finished and released towards the end of 1998, sending shockwaves throughout the Saturn community. Welcome to Survival Horror. If you've played the first Resident Evil on the Saturn, you know what to expect here. You move around your 3D polygon character in each scene that has fixed camera angles against 2D backdrops. This creates a sense of depth beyond the normal 2D experience, and allows you to explore a single image as if you had access to it in 3D. The story picks up where the first left off. Umbrella is still up to no good, and a new, more potent virus has been let loose in Raccoon City turning its inhabitants into flesh-eating ghouls. You have a choice of two characters to play with, just like you did in the first one. Claire, the sister of Chris Redfield, and Leon, a new police officer that just arrived in town. You have four adventures to undertake this time around, playing each character through two different paths, which offers quite a bit more replay value beyond the first game. Each character's path does cross the other at various times, and you can even leave behind a few key items to help you out when you play the second time through. The gameplay is extremely similar to the first game in regards to combat, running, and interacting with items. It does employ tank controls, which means pressing up to walk, down to retreat, so on and so forth. If you've never played these types of games before, there can be a bit of a learning curve. There have been numerous animations added to improve the experience over the first, however, particularly in the way you respond to damage. Take enough hits and your character will show it in the way they walk. Take enough and you'll barely be able to move around. Also like the first, you will be graded based on your performance. Do it well enough and fast enough, and you can open weapons and unlimited ammo. The Saturn version here plays great, thankfully. Your character is just as responsive as the PlayStation original, and there are no noticeable performance dips to rain on this parade. Very much like the first game, the overall experience here is very similar, and the only real variance is your preference for the controller. The real star of this one is of course the replay value. By giving the two playable characters two separate routes to play, the three to six hours it will take you to defeat each one guarantees a minimum of 12 to 24 hours worth of content just to see the baseline game. Add a couple of second runs and you have more than enough here to justify its existence. Play well enough and you'll open up the extras that make replaying it a different experience altogether. With Sega's support, Capcom decided to do this version in-house as opposed to outsourcing it like it did with the original. With the increase in manpower and resources, we see a vastly improved product in regards to visual presentation. The game runs in the Saturn's highest resolution mode of 704x480, 
and uses the 4 megabyte RAM expansion cart for texture and asset storage for improved image quality and manageable load times. Of course, using this graphics mode of the Saturn means a few trade-offs. First, the lighting engine is completely missing. No more colored lighting from fires or flashes from your weapon. This sets in direct contrast to the PlayStation version that had robust light sourcing effects in many areas. Capcom also traded off the additional use of processing power for transparency effects and went the full dithering approach. This concerns effects like blood, fire, water, and smoke. Since many of these special effects are animated, they don't look quite as bad as the stationary blobs often seen in other games, but they are definitely a downgrade from the original. The nice thing is that these trade-offs do come with some improvements, particularly in the texture quality, which is much sharper and detailed here thanks to the improved resolution and increase in available video memory. Close-up shots favor the Saturn across the entire game, sands where transparencies are concerned. There are a few other areas where the Saturn game shows some weaknesses. While the actual full motion video quality is quite good, the Saturn version features a smaller window. You will notice a longer time in between the video actually starting on the Saturn, which makes it feel a bit disjointed. The PlayStation version has minimal downtime between switching screens. Most of the audio between the two is quite similar, and there is virtually no distinction between them in regards to the music itself. However, the Saturn game does have lower quality sound effects. They sound as if they were compressed much more than the PlayStation version, particularly the voices, though you will hear it in other areas like enemy groans and gunfire. Some sound effects even sound as if they are cut off from time to time. I also noticed that the Saturn version has a few instances of actually loading during screen transitions. I don't mean leaving a room, I mean the same room moving from one view to another. Most of the time this feels identical to the PlayStation, but others can be noticeably longer and more intrusive. Perhaps it needing to load additional assets here and there during actual gameplay. The first Resident Evil on the Saturn received a number of extras, and Part 2 here does as well. It receives all the things you saw in the original, including hidden keys, outfits, and weapons. But you also get a new random battle mode that thrusts you into a survival situation with different weapons, ammo amounts, and enemies. Sometimes you get an easy run of things, but sometimes you get pitted against a tyrant with nothing but a knife. You can exit the area anytime you want, but it affects your overall ranking. Of course, while games like Resident Evil 2, Grandia, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, and Radiant Silvergun reinvigorated the Saturn market in the US and Europe, the Sony PlayStation would still go on to outsell it by quite a bit. But Sega's new strategy of leveraging its Japanese properties and forging new relationships with third parties had led Saturn to a global total in sales of 25 million systems, a huge increase from the projected 9 million by some industry prognosticators. The quality of these second and third generation titles made sure the Saturn was finally noticed by mainstream gamers, and Resident Evil 2 definitely helped play a role in that. Like most titles on the Saturn, its elaborate architecture made sure that it looked quite a bit different from other versions on the market. While I missed some of the special effects that were lost on the Saturn, there was a major increase in the resolution and texture detail that definitely benefited the overall presentation. The Saturn would not receive a port of Resident Evil 3 due to Sega launching the Dreamcast worldwide in late 1999, but the Saturn had a full life of excellent software for five years, and Resident Evil 2 here was certainly well worth the wait. I'm Sega Lord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time. Oh, and by the way, happy April Fool's Day.